talk about austerity. Uh, everybody in this room knows what we mean by austerity. Right? No, because uh, when we were thinking about how we were going to like, you know, brand this campaign, there were those who said, "Well, people know about cutbacks. They know about job cuts, and layoffs, and so on and so forth." But you know. Uh, not that many people are familiar with austerity, but I, I think that more and more people are hearing it and seeing it in life, uh, that, it's, that it's an okay thing to talk about. And in fact, it's not just the communists that are talking about austerity and its impact and the need to struggle against it. You find this uh, nowadays, all sorts of organizations, trade unions um, and uh, labor federations, and student organizations, uh, People involved with health care, um, even pensioners are talking about austerity and its impact and the need to struggle against it. So it kind of begs the question in a way, well, okay, well, why is the Communist Party also talking about it? I mean, are we basically saying the same thing? Well, in, in many respects we are, but, in, but we think we bring something to the table in terms of the discussion because we think that in order to struggle against this agenda, this right-wing agenda, Harper agenda, neoliberal offensive, capitalist offensive, austerity offensive. It's important not just to know that it's bad, that it hurts, you know, but to understand the context. Where, where is all this coming from? And why? And whose interest does it serve? We certainly know whose interests it harms, whether you're an Aboriginal person or a student trying to get an education or a young worker looking for a decent wage and the possibility maybe someday of actually being having enough money to, to, to get a mortgage and own, own your own home, um, which is getting more and more um, remote for, for uh, a lot of young people. Um, but there are those who are actually benefiting, believe it or not, from austerity. Um, and then what is the relationship between these social policies, these economic policies at home, and things that are happening around the world? Most importantly, the whole rise of militarism and war. You know, wars are happening all the time now. There's now another uh, conflict in, in Mali, you know, threats to go into Syria and Iran and uh, uh, threats against, uh, uh, in Latin America, against Venezuela and Bolivia, attempts to destabilize governments and so on. There is a real offensive, there's a real struggle going on internationally, a very dangerous world. Most of you in this room were too young to remember the Cold War, but you probably studied it and heard about it, maybe from your parents or uh, in, 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 your, in the course of your education. But I remember well that in 1991, when the Soviet Union kind of imploded, just kind of disappeared, Warsaw Pact eliminated everything. Said, "Yay, we got peace now, and no more, you know, evil empire to the east. The Soviet Union is gone. And the arms race is going to end. And all that money that was been wasted year after year after year build, building nuclear missiles and chemical weapons and all sorts of other." you know, military hardware, all that now can be used for constructive purposes, to build more schools, childcare centers, things like that. Um, there was this, this idea of a peace dividend. In fact, if you look at the last 20 years, there have been more wars, and more victims of wars, and more frequency of wars breaking out all around the world. And we would argue that there's an important connection between these domestic, social, and economic policies and what's happening internationally, what's happening in terms of the environment and the, and the, the deepening crisis with respect to the environment, and what's happening around very fundamental questions like democracy. In many respects, our societies, and not just in Canada, not just in Ontario or locally, but in fact, in countries all around the world, there is an increasing encroachment on established 
uh, a basis of democratic participation by, by the people, the right to dissent, the right to protest, uh, the right for alternative parties even to exist, and so on and so forth. And rather than an expansion of democracy, which once again was held out, oh, this, the defeat of the Soviet Union means a great victory for democracy. You know, and you had all sorts of politicians of the day, including, you know, uh, George W. Bush and others saying, we're the great force for democracy around the world. In fact, democracy is becoming increasingly uh, not only encroached upon, but uh, trivialized as well and, and reduced in terms of its real substance. So there's a connection between all of these things, and it's one of the things that, that uh, uh, our party wants to raise in the context of this discussion about austerity. So cutbacks, restraint policies, the drive for concessions, either from workers, from their bosses, in terms of you know, cuts in their wages and their benefits, or cuts in social services, uh, uh, increases in user fees. Tuition, by the way, is one of the most important types of user fees, but there's all sorts of user fees that people are being hit with, you know, families are being hit with. I don't know if uh, any of you have any uh, young children, but, you know, I have, a, have an eight-year-old. Uh, it seems like almost every other, almost every week, there is another user fee that we have to pay for, for her education, which when I went to school, we never had to pay for. We used to have free field trips, for instance. Now parents have to pay for field trips, to pay for this, pay for that, so on and so forth. Supplies that used to be provided through the, through the public education system that aren't being provided. So all these kinds of user fees all over the place um, that, that people are being hit with. But in a certain sense, that's not new, right? This, this, uh, these policies of restraint and cutbacks have actually been around since the 80s. If you go back historically, you can see that there was a kind of a shift, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about that in a second. But, you know, um, even to the time of Brian Mulroney, uh, and later on when uh, the Liberals got in and Kretschan got in, and, you know, there were, there, were, there were cutbacks. So what's different now? Well, we would suggest a few things. Number one, the kinds of attacks that are taking place today are much more intense than they were before, okay? much sharper. Workers now are, are, are going into negotiations and bosses are saying, we want not a wage freeze, you know, we want a 30, a 40, a 50 percent wage cut. You know, that struggle that took place out in, uh, in, in London at the Caterpillar plant, you know, where, the, where there was an occupation and stuff like that. Why did that happen? It was because Caterpillar came in and said to those workers, Right? Highly trained, skilled workers making these big uh, uh, locomotives. That they had to accept a 50% wage cut. Now think about that. You know, you've got a mortgage, you've got car payments, right? You've got kids in school, and all of a sudden, the boss is saying, you want a job? You've got to accept 50% cut. So the intensity of a lot of these tax has sharpened. And by the way, if you go to Europe, you look at what's happening in places like Italy, Spain, Greece, Portugal, a number of countries in Europe, uh, it's even worse. You know, they're cutting the minimum wage, not just not raising the minimum wage, actually cutting the minimum wage, and particularly for young people. Okay? They're saying that well, you can't retire at 65 anymore, you've got to retire at 67, 68, 69. I mean, a whole number of things uh, like that. So much more intense attack. The other thing that's new is that you could say the breadth of this attack. It used to be that they would say, well, we have to do something in healthcare. We have to do something over here. Now they're saying everything's on the table. Every aspect of social life, every kind of so-called social entitlement. I love this expression, social entitlement. It's a really a loaded expression because it makes it sound like Oh, you people, you masses think that you're entitled to these things, and we want to reopen that whole question. You shouldn't be entitled to quality education. You shouldn't be entitled to universal health care. You shouldn't be entitled to other kinds of social services and so on and so forth, benefits, which, by the way, were never given to us. Right? Some benevolent uh, power above came down and bestowed these benefits on us. They came as a, as a result of decades upon decades of struggle by working people, 
to say that, you know, we're the ones doing the labor. We're the ones creating the wealth. And yet, the rich, by dint, only because they own the factories, we're expropriating a big chunk of that wealth. And they were getting richer and richer, and we're getting poorer and poorer, and we want to change that relationship. We want a bigger slice of the pie for those who actually do the work, who actually build the railways and the schools and the factories and, and, and the products that people need. And so forth. But now they're saying all of that is now up for uh, change. So it's not just the intensity of it, it's also the breadth of it. There's not a single aspect of social entitlement or social programs or services that they can't not attack. And they're, they're planning to do it, in fact. And they're starting to do it already. Third aspect is, you could say, almost the universal aspect of this offensive. Because it's not just happening in Canada. It's happening in country after country after country. And it's not a coincidence either. Right? There is, in fact, an internationally coordinated strategy to take back. It's not just, you know, some politician in Belgium happens to read a newspaper from Italy and say, oh, look what they're doing there. Maybe we'll do it here as well. Cool, cool idea. No, there is an actually, and I'm not talking conspiracy theories here, but, you know, when they have these, uh, these meetings in... Uh, yeah, the G8, the G20s, and so on and so forth, when they, when they have all of these kind of think tank uh, 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 conferences and, and whatnot in Switzerland. What's the name of the place in Switzerland? Davos, the Davos forums, you know? It's, they're, they're working out their, their strategy for, for this kind of uh, global uh, offensive against the people and against the gains of the working class and, and uh, uh, oppressed people. So. And the fourth aspect, which I would argue is new, is that it used to be that when they cut back something, they would say, depending on the politics of the government of the day, the Tories would say, we're cutting it back because it should be cut back. Can't afford it. The liberals, on the other hand, would say, we're cutting it back because we have to cut it back. It really hurts us, you know, and, and we feel your pain, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, but it was always from the point of view that it was a temporary measure was necessary for some budgetary reason or because there was a slight downturn in the economy or whatever, Re government revenues were down and so on and so forth. But that, for a few years, we'd restore these things, continue the forward march. That's not what they're saying anymore. You listen very carefully. Actually, you don't even have to listen that carefully because they're saying it quite regularly now. They're saying, we are in the era of austerity. Well, you know what an era is. It's not a period, it's not a, a momentary uh, hiccup in time. It's a protracted period of restraint, of austerity, of cutbacks. And in a way, it reminds me of George W. Bush after the 9-11, you know, back, again, quite a while ago, 2001, when they were talking about the war on terror, or the war on terrorism. Um, they said, well, this is a permanent war. This is not a short-term thing. It's going to go on and on and on, and it has for the last 10 years or more. Well, they're in, in a way, they're saying there's going to be a permanent uh, war of austerity on the people. So get used to it. Suck it up. You know, there is no alternative but uh, our, our agenda. So in that sense, what's coming down the tubes is really something new even though it's not the first time things have been cut back. I want to say a few words about where all this is coming from. Why? Austerity. Now. And everywhere. And to do that, I have to give you kind of like a five-minute uh, history uh, lesson. So please bear with me. I'll try and be brief about this. We could probably even go back further, but I'm going to go back to the end of World War II. All right? So 60 years or 70 years. Hitler and Nazism are defeated in Europe, right? Mussolini and Italian fascists, Japanese imperialism. And uh, it's a bright new day. United Nations is born, you know, um, started the decolonization of Africa and other countries and so on. So it was really quite, a, quite an important historical moment, the defeat of fascism uh, uh, during the Second World War. 
But what came out of that? What came out of it was that the Soviet Union, which of course had existed before, back to 1917, but the Soviet Union came out of the Second World War with much uh, greater influence and prestige, right? Because it played a, a very important role in defeating um, especially German, uh, German fascism. And there was a socialist community in Eastern Europe. But not only was there, you know, countries like Czechoslovakia and Poland and you know, Romania, you know, these Eastern European countries, but in the West as well, in countries like Greece and Italy and France, the communist parties in these countries were the largest parties at the end of the Second World War. Why? Because it was the communists who led the partisan struggles. They, they, they were the ones in the front ranks, you know, uh, of fighting against the occupation, against the Nazis, and so on and so forth. They had tremendous respect amongst the people because of the role they played during the Second World War. But more than that, it was because people realized that socialism can work. Because in fact, during the Second World War, there was a type of socialism, even right here in Canada. There were controls on profits during the Second World War. Most history classes that we take about Canadian history, they never teach that, but it's true. There were price controls in place. There were guarantees for, for, for workers' rights, which are better, were better then, in many respects, than they are even today. And most important was this sense that we can organize our societies without having fat cats, capitalists, monopolists running things. And so it's very interesting that at the end of the Second World War, right here in Canada, the government of the day uh, um, uh, commissioned a poll. You know, they were polling even back then. The only difference is, is you can read about it in the newspaper. They were private polls, but they wanted to find out how Canadians felt. And they asked the question to Canadians in this poll, after the war, after the dust settles, you know, um, what kind of uh, economic system do you think is best for Canada, capitalism or socialism? And do you know, and this is, this is also came out subsequently after the 30 year period and whatnot, and here again, the mainstream press didn't say very much, but they did report it back in the 80s, but, it was, you know. But this poll indicated that 48% of Canadians favored socialism. 48, think about it. Almost the, almost the majority of Canadians were in favor of socialism. And it was a similar situation in the United States. And in fact, right around the world, there was strong support for, um, socialized medicine, for universal health care, for, for um, um, uh, pensions, for uh, uh, union power, trade union uh, rights, and so on and so forth, and in fact, even for socialism. So the ruling class, you know, at the end of the Second World War had a big problem. First of all, they had the Soviet Union and the, and the, and the you know, uh, there was a, a coming uh, revolution in China, the Chinese Revolution, right? Uh, and so on, it, it's countries in Eastern Europe. Secondly, you had uh, a significant section of, of the peoples in Western Europe, in North America, in Latin America and elsewhere, who actually were in favor of socialism and supported communist parties. Big problem. What did they do? They had two main tactics to respond to this. The first tactic was, uh, this is the, the, I guess the obvious one, was uh, anti-communism. It wasn't by accident that McCarthyism and all that stuff, the Red Scare, and, you, know, uh, you know, look for Reds under the beds, all that kind of you know, hysteria was whipped up. It was in direct response to the fact that they were worried that the masses of people were moving towards uh, the left and the revolutionary left. And they wanted to isolate the communists, marginalize them, uh, and scare people away uh, from communist parties and even the ideas of socialism. That was the first thing. That's an obvious thing, right? 
the Red Scare. But the other tactic, and in many respects, uh, even more significant tactic, was a decision to, uh, we better give the masses something. Why? Because in the Soviet Union, they'd eliminated unemployment. You know, Johan was just talking earlier about unemployment. They'd eliminated unemployment. They had um, extensive rights for women. They had, a, you know, universal health care, which we didn't get in Canada until the 60s. They had it, you know, in the, in the Soviet Union. They had child care centers all over the place. They had all sorts of social benefits. So the ruling class said, we've got to give the people something. Not in all countries, not in the third world countries, but in the capitalist countries, in Europe and North America, we've got to give them something or else they're, they're going to revolt. No, they're going to start voting for, for, for radical left parties like the communists and, and others. And so you saw the birth of the welfare state. You know, you've probably heard this expression of the welfare state. Where did it come from? Well, it came from that period. But all of a sudden, they started saying, okay, we can do this. Okay, we can set up a pension system like the Canada Pension Plan, unemployment insurance, which didn't exist before. You know? There were struggles for it. Workers fought for it. The unemployed fought for it. But capitalist states refused to implement it. All of a sudden, after the war, they changed their tune. Why? Because they had come up with this two-sided tactic. Red scare and let's give some crumbs to the masses so that they won't, not only so that they won't revolt, but also to kind of um, um, cultivate this idea of collaborationism. The governments are doing good things, you know. Um, that uh, what's good for business really is good for the country. You know, what's good for General Motors is good for America. You know, uh, this idea that we're all together and we're all, you know, it was a very important aspect to it. But that raises another question. That money that went into all of these services that started to expand after the Second World War had to come from somewhere. And it came from corporate profits. You know that at the end of the Second World War and even into the 50s, corporations in this country paid almost 50% of all government revenues came from corporate taxes. Now it's about 6%. They have cut and cut and cut corporate taxes and increased taxes on the workers, on, on people, real, you know, either income taxes or things like sales taxes, GST, all this, you know. There's been a major shift in the tax policy. But after the Second World War, corporations, the banks, the wealthy, we're paying a significant amount of government revenues. Why would they do that? They, were do they did it because, first of all, they were worried about revolution. But secondly, because they were still making profits. There was a big boom after the Second World War. Why? Because all of Europe had been destroyed. You know? I mean, literally destroyed. Factories had to be rebuilt, hospitals had to be rebuilt, uh, schools had to be rebuilt. There was uh, an engine for growth, for a boom cycle, which was extended. And so even though they were giving some of their profits to pay for these social programs, they were still doing okay. And that lasted for several decades, actually, until the early 70s. All of a sudden, that started to peter out. And by 74, 75, there actually was a, a um, kind of a, a, a recession. It wasn't as bad as the current one, but there was a, a downturn. And it was at that point that the ruling circles said, we can't afford this welfare state anymore because now profits are going down. So that's affecting us in the pocket. So there was a shift in policy. Shift in policy came about not because of some government decision or some academic wrote a paper. It's because the ruling class decided <laughs> we've got to change things because we're losing money, because the rate of profit is declining. And that's when you saw people like Professor Milton Friedman from the Chicago School of Economics and whatnot, who had been writing all along, but was ignored. All of a sudden he was grabbed onto it. He said, oh, this guy is a genius, <laughs> because he was advocating what? 
supply side economics, right? Uh, um, essentially, neoliberalism, or what we talk, refer to now as neoliberalism. The market should dominate, uh, uh, governments should be curbed from providing services and redistributing wealth, uh, and so on. And that's when Thatcher got elected in, in Britain, and Ronald Reagan came to power in the United States, and it was the start of the turn towards these more vicious policies by monopoly. And it was successful. <laughs> not for us, not for the people, but it was successful for business. And all of a sudden, the declining rate of profit started to go up again. And in fact, it resulted in massive accumulation of wealth, of capital. This posed a problem. What do we do with all this money? Because a capitalist, his biggest fear, or her biggest fear, is once I have more capital, where am I going to invest it next so it can make even more capital? But that's the logic of capitalism, yes? So the capitalists said, well, well, things are great, but what next? Where do we go now? And that's when you saw, for instance, uh, an expansion of um, foreign loans to Latin America, to, to, you know, in Africa and other countries. And you found countries in these third world countries going massively into debt. You know? And at the time, people were saying, well, there's a big debt problem in Latin America, Mexico, and other countries, you know, right? Um, even to the point that they couldn't even afford to pay the interest payments. And to blame those governments for it, yeah, but somebody was giving them the money. It was the banks in Europe. It was uh, uh, in, in New York City and so on and so forth, who were advancing this capital because they had such a glut of capital. That worked for a time, but still, there was a big problem because even on a global scale, ultimately people didn't have enough money to buy the goods that they were producing. So there was a glut of surplus of goods. This is another big problem for capitalists, right? In order to realize this new wealth, they have to eventually sell the products that they have in their warehouses. And who are they going to sell them to but the people? And if the people don't have enough money to buy it, that's when they run into a problem. They can't change those iPods or whatever back into, into cash, right? In, in, into into uh, liquid assets. Warehouses get higher and higher. This is classic, by the way, in capitalism. And that's why you have this boom and bust process cyclical crises under capitalism. It goes way back to the 1800s. But something new happened in the, in the um, mid to late 90s. They said, okay, we need to keep people, keep buying, even though they, don't, they can't afford it. And we've got all this excess capital, surplus capital. We're just going to encourage people to go deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. And we're going to raise people's credit limits and provide more mortgages and get people to buy bigger houses and so on and so forth to keep the wheels of production churning, to keep the economy motoring along and making more and more wealth. But it was on the basis of what? Bigger and bigger and bigger debt unsustainable levels of debt. It's like a big bubble. Finally, that bubble, too, had to burst. And that's what happened in 2007, 2008. The stock market collapsed. Everything went to uh, hell in a handbasket. But then what happened? What happened then was you had major, not minor banks or third world, you know, governments or, or third, you know, smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses. You had major actors, General Motors, Ford, um, Chase Manhattan Bank, you know, uh, AIG Insurance, massive corporate entities, monopolies, who all of a sudden were on the verge of bankruptcy. Right? And then what happened? Wow. 
the ruling class got together and said, well, we cannot afford to have these big actors fail. They're too big to fail. They have to be rescued. Right? When, when workers, whole, whole communities, whole cities, you know, factories close and people going on employment, they don't worry about us failing. But these big corporate ent entities, these big financial houses, they're too big to fail. They're too important. They have to be bailed out. And they were bailed out. And the bailouts amounted, depending on how it's uh, determined, there's different methods of, you know, economists figuring out, you know, exactly what is a bailout, what isn't a bailout. But it's estimated, even by bourgeois economists, that the global bailout that took place in 2008, 2009, amounted to somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 15 trillion dollars. Trillion dollars. I mean, it's such a big number that we can't even sometimes wrap our, our heads around it. And where did this money come from? It came from governments going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. And where did they get that money, those lines of credit from? From the banks. The very ones that they were bailing out. You know, you can see the, the, the insanity of all of this, right? But, they, but that's what happened. That's really, really what happened. If you cut through all of the, the fog and the mystification of what, what's transpired over the past several years, that's really what happened. And to make this kind of tragedy even more comic and farcical, you had some sections of capitalists who saw the collapse coming and who, in fact, bet on the collapse coming by short selling, by going into futures markets and betting against the market and so on and so forth, and who made hundreds of billions of dollars of profit on the collapse. That's the wizardry of capitalism. It's amazing, you know. It also speaks to the utter uh, irrationality of a system that allows, not only allows individuals to benefit on a social crisis of that magnitude, but actually rewards them. Well, they're the smart ones. They're good gamblers. And you hear this all the time, this reference to gambling. The stock market is nothing but, you know, it's like a casino capitalism. Some winners, some losers. Mm. But, you know, it's not a good analogy. I don't know if anybody in this room gambles. I don't. But people do. They go to the casino and might lose their paycheck. Right? And don't, for a moment, Misunderstand me, I'm not justifying that. You know, it's a serious social problem, especially with some. You know, it's a kind of an addiction uh, for some gambling. <clears throat> and it certainly has social ramifications. But at the end of the day, when people gamble, they lose their own money. Right? They put down their wager, you know, and they win or they lose. But these guys weren't, first of all, gambling with their own money. And secondly, The nature of that gambling had an impact which went well beyond their own personal families. It impacted on whole communities, on whole countries even. You know? So it's much, that's much worse than gambling. But sometimes when people talk about you know, casino capitalism, in a, in a way it kind of understates really how um, how parasitic and how toxic uh, uh, monopoly finance capitalism has, has become. Really. And we're seeing the impact of it. Okay, so the governments go wildly into debt. But then the banks start getting worried that they're not going to get their payments back. And they go to the governments and they say, you pay us first. Everything else comes second. And so then the governments use that as a justification to say, okay, we have to, we really have to cut now. We have to cut everything. 
That is where this austerity offensive comes from. And it's important for us to really understand it, to see it in the larger context of a deepening crisis of the system as a whole, not just as a momentary. And how, uh, 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 how dangerous and how necessary it is uh, to struggle against it. The victims, pretty obvious, right? It's, uh, in the first place, the working class. And they are attacking unions more viciously now than ever before. And by the way, when Harper got his majority last year, it's not by accident that the first people he attacked were, were the postal workers. Then he went after the Air Canada workers and the wheat board workers and so on and so forth and started legislating, you know, unions breaking their right to collective bargaining and so on and so forth, taking away the right to strike and so on. But of course, it's not just unions and, and workers, it's also um, uh, Aboriginal people, like Johan spoke about, it's youth and students, um, it's pensioners, and so on and so forth. And it, as I mentioned earlier, it's also democratic rights. It's also amongst its victims is the environment. And you can see that again from the Harper government uh, attacking environmental uh, impact assessment uh, uh, processes and so on. And in fact, making it such that some mega projects in the resource sector will now be completely uh, exempt from environmental assessments. Uh, open up the door wide open for, uh, uh, for the plunder of uh, Mother Nature for profit, uh, and, and particularly for the benefit of, uh, of monopoly capital. Um, so there are many victims. And it's also important to remember where this offensive is coming from. A lot of people say it's Harper, and in a certain sense that's true. But in another more fundamental sense, it's not true. It's not coming from Harper. It's coming from uh, finance capital. That's where the drive is coming. But Harper is their guy. And by the way, it's interesting that in the last federal election, because historically, you know, the banks, the big companies, you know, they would give money both to the Liberals and the Tories. But in the last election, they basically gave everything to the, to the Tories. The Tories were their preferred party. Why? Because they knew that this offensive had to be carried out, and they had confidence that the Harper Conservatives were, were the ones to do it. That's their hard nose and they're, you know, really, really uh, reactionary. <clears throat> so. Yes, it's the Harper Tories, it's, uh, it's provincial governments right here in Ontario, the attack on teachers, for instance, is part of this offensive. I don't know what it's like in Guelph, but I know in Toronto, we have Rob Ford in Toronto, carrying out similar austerity policies at the municipal level. So it's, 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 uh, it's happening at every level. What's, uh, what's encouraging, however, is that there is a fight back that's growing. It's not growing in Parliament. And here I have to say something about the NDP. Because again, after the last federal election, there were a lot of people, quite sincerely, who, were, who said, well, it's bad that Harper got his majority. That's really bad. But the silver lining is that the NDP is now the official opposition. They got 101 seats. Uh, and uh, so this, this is positive. But even amongst a lot of uh, NDP supporters and members, um, there's been a lot of disappointment over the past 18 months because um, the, the strategy of the NDP caucus in Parliament has not been to, to mount a really strong fight and to link up with, with workers and with the Aboriginal peoples and with other people's movements to support extra parliamentary fights. In fact, the, the strategy has been really quite different. It has been to keep a low profile not to take positions on controversial issues. And it's, and it's motivated for, for two reasons, I would argue. First reason is uh, just sheer electoral opportunism. This idea, which by the way isn't new to Thomas Mulcair, and has been tried many times before provincially, uh, uh, at the provincial level, is the following. We should keep our gunpowder dry 
we should play a low profile. We should wait for Tory or Liberal government to fall on their sword, right? You know, to piss people off enough that uh, they're ready to kick them out. And then we can kind of slide in. We won't make enemies, but people will vote for us by default, you know, and so on. And Mulcair is carrying out that kind of strategy federally now. I think that, in, well, if we, if we play it cool, we can slide into office in 2015. That strategy doesn't work, in fact. It really doesn't work. Um, I know, I used to live on BC <coughs> back in the 80s, and the, the NDP had this kind of strategy to get rid of the uh, social credit government. They thought, well, no, don't protest, don't march in the streets, don't go on strike because uh, that'll just you know, get people scared and whatnot, and just keep your gunpowder dry. They actually use the expression, keep your gunpowder dry, organize, I mean, you know, get your voters lists and do that kind of, you know, narrow parliamentary electoral stuff. And then when the election comes, we'll, we'll get the Socrates out and we'll get into power and we'll undo all, all the damage that they did. <coughs> And in fact, of course, it, 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 it didn't work um, because one of, the, uh, one of the reasons it didn't work is that people felt, well, why should we vote for the NDP? I mean, they, they haven't really supported us. They haven't really been fighting for us. Um, and secondly, just because people didn't see much of a difference between the parties. And you know, even on, on, in terms of the Harper agenda, if you look at what's being said from the NDP benches right now, it's usually a criticism over process. You should have consulted more. You should have, you know, right? There should have been more hearings, but not on the substantive questions. And on many of the substantive questions, they find themselves in agreement. And that's, the, I guess, the more serious problem, not just with the NDP, but with social democratic parties right around the world. In Greece, for instance, the Socialist Party brought in the austerity measures, right? Uh, uh, Blair and the Labour Party in Britain, you know, brought in all sorts of cutbacks in the healthcare sector and a whole number of other uh, social programs and so on. The same thing happened in France, the same thing happened in the uh, Social Democratic Party in Portugal, and so on and so forth. And why is that? It's because a lot of the, most of the Social Democratic Parties have basically, the leadership, not necessarily all members, but the leadership has basically bought into the logic of neoliberalism, of the primacy of the private market, that government has to play a smaller role, and so on and so forth. They never call for nationalizing anything anymore, you know, and so on. And they say that, well, somehow, um, they don't even talk about socialism anymore. They talk about, uh, well, we can administer capitalism better. We can do it with more of a human face. But they basically bought into the logic of uh, neoliberalism. And that is a big problem. But despite that, and despite this massive offensive that's coming from corporations and coming from Reitman governments and so on and so forth, there is a tremendous fight back that's growing in this country. And it's growing not only here, but around the world. Um, think about the Occupy movement. It's great. I mean, yeah, we can all criticize it, and some of its weaknesses, and so on. But it, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it struck something with people, masses of people who said, yeah, there's something fundamentally wrong when the one percent benefits at the expense of the rest, of the, the other ninety-nine percent. You know, it was a very powerful uh, kind of, um, uh, you could say, metaphor for what's for what's going on. Maybe not the most scientific metaphor, because it's not so much a question of percentages, right? It has to do with class, it has, it has to do with who owns the wealth and who doesn't own the wealth and has to work for a living. But, but nonetheless, it was very, very powerful, and that's why so many people gravitated to it and brought so many young people into, into action that they'd never been involved in political action before. It was beautiful. Um, Johan talked about the, the student struggle in Quebec. Brilliant. What a, what a, 
Yeah, and what are some of the main lessons that came out of that? The importance of unity, right? Of keeping united in the face of all of this offensive that was made. Bill 78, all the attempts to kind of split up the student federations and turn them against one another. And, and yet through all of that, they held together. The other important lesson is to link up their struggle around tuitions with the whole struggle against neoliberalism. That's why they got so much support. That's why hundreds of thousands of people, they weren't all students. I was down in one of the marches, I think, well, I guess the April or May, um, uh, the big monthly marches, because they marched every day too, but they would have every month, they would have, I think it was on the 22nd of every month, they would have these massive marches. And there was like 300,000 people in the streets of Montreal. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, and there were old people, and they were um, uh, the trade unionists, and they were, you know, anti-poverty activists, and uh, homeless, I mean, it was, they weren't just students. That's the point. Because they linked up their struggle with other struggles. That's another very important lesson. And I guess the most important lesson was to, to fight to, to, to struggle and not to duck for cover and hope that somehow we get right out this storm, you know, like uh, seek, seek refuge uh, and, and whatnot, keep our gunpowder dry. And it was precisely because they fought, and by the way, at the time, uh, there were those in the student movement in Quebec as well who said, you know, that these protests are going to turn people off, they're going to scare people. and. Uh, it's going to actually keep Charest and the Liberals in power. But in fact, there was an election right after that, and uh, Charest was defeated. <coughs> and the student mobilizations played a big role in that. <coughs> and it shows that when people are in motion, you know, and they're fighting, whether it's workers, you know, against the boss or communities or, you know, students, but that carries over into the elections. People are that much more. Uh, because they can see what's at stake in an election, because they've been fighting, you know, so they've been in motion. Um, and then, of course, there's the I Don't Know More movement, uh, most recently, which is uh, here again, you know, very significant. I, uh, the other significant thing about both I Don't Know More and the student protests, and, and for that matter, even Occupy, is the fact that it didn't come from on top, you know. Um, some of it came from. Uh, leading organizations that were federations in Quebec and so on, but uh, it involved masses of people in real uh, participation. Not that they just got a leaflet saying come out to a demonstration, you know. They had general assemblies, they had, you know, there was kind of a mass involvement. People felt, you know, they took ownership over it, right? Very important. These are very important lessons for the future. That's certainly the case with Idle No More which didn't come from the Assembly of First Nations. It didn't come from a lot of the organized structures within the Aboriginal, uh, amongst Aboriginal nations. You know? It came from uh, grassroots uh, uh, activists. Um, and then these organizations had to, had to, had to scramble to keep up <laughs> with their own people, you know, and, and join with their own people. And all of a sudden you saw chiefs coming out to these things, but they weren't being asked to speak. <laughs> That was interesting. Well, uh, these are kinds of lessons that we need to draw upon. You know, the need to build uh, unity and to fight against, because every time a real struggle, a real struggle starts, the ruling class, one of the first things they do is move to create divisions. You know, they did it in the, in the Occupy movement. They tried to, you know, turn people against the Occupy movement. They certainly did it in Quebec, where they were trying to break some of the federations away from the most militant, Federation, which was the uh, Class A, right? And they're doing it right now with the I Don't Know More movement, you know? Focusing on differences, who supports who, and isn't this a criticism of the AFN? And, you know, you know trying, to, trying, to, trying to breed divisions. And they do that because they know that the one thing that the people have, right, are our numbers, are our numbers. The ruling class has the government. Make no mistake about it. It's not a people's government. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a capitalist government, right? Carrying out the interests of the capitalist class, Bay Street. They have the courts. They have the police. They have all of their economic power. They control the media. 
They have all of these uh, tools and instruments of manipulation, of coercion, of division at their disposal. The only thing that the people have are our numbers. And if we're divided, that negates the only advantage that we have. And that's why the question of unity is, is, is so important. But we need to build unity, not just based on holding the line, not just based on trying to maintain the status quo. There was a, a folk singer, some of you may be familiar with him or not, more of my generation than yours, I guess, but uh, a Canadian uh, folk singer by the name of Bruce Coburn, who uh, one of his tunes, or one of the lyrics in one of his tunes was, the trouble with normal is it always gets worse. You know? mm. And certainly, the, you know, the, what's normal today is a lot worse than what was the status quo or normal even 20 years ago. I mean, just think about it. With all these advances in technology and increased productivity, Canadians are working more hours. They're working longer uh, work weeks today than they did 20 years ago. And the disparity between the rich and the poor has grown. Right? So, um, so I lost my train of thought. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, about the question of trying to hold the line. Holding the line is a losing strategy. We need to go on a counteroffensive. We need to say, no, we're not just going to defeat this grab, that take back. We need to say, no, we, we're going to change. We, we're going to struggle to change fundamental relations in society, to put people before profit, to put nature before profit, uh, and to, and to uh, um, uh, uh, build a movement which is strong enough, not just electorally, but in a real sense, amongst the masses of the people, uh, um, to uh, uh, essentially bring about a fundamental change. And that's why even being anti-capitalist, I would argue, is not enough. It's great that more and more people are anti-capitalists. What's good about it is that they're at least making a systemic criticism of capitalism, they're not just saying, I, I'm anti-Harper or I'm anti this bill, or that, you know, cutback. You know, they're saying, you know, I'm opposed to capitalism. That is very important, don't get me wrong. But it still kind of begs the question, if not capitalism, then what? That's why, uh, from our perspective, it's important to say, no, there is an alternative, and it's socialism. And that's one of the re main reasons why there's such a big ideological attack on the ideas of socialism. Because they know that that's the only alternative to the system. So once they convince people socialism's a non-starter, you know, and they talk about, oh, what happened in the Soviet Union or whatever, uh, been there, done that, didn't work, <laughs> end of debate, right? But what's the essence of socialism? The essence is that uh, the people, um, in fact, are the true masters of their destiny. Um, the Communist Manifesto was written by Frederick Engels and uh, Karl Marx more than 150 years ago, placed it very succinctly. They said socialism really, really is democracy by the people, for the people, and of the people. You know, those words from the U.S. Uh, Declaration of Independence, whatever. But, you know, that in fact it's, it's socialism where the majority of the people, the working class, the people who produce uh, the wealth, uh, are in charge, and not the fat cats, not those privileged, and it's a smaller and smaller, more concentrated uh, group of monopoly capitalists who own everything. Um, that's the essence of, of uh, socialism, and that's the really only alternative, social ownership or private monopoly ownership. There's no third road. If you think about it, there can't possibly be a third road. And so why, why the importance of embracing socialism as part of the struggle? It doesn't mean that socialism is going to come tomorrow. And it doesn't mean that we should necessarily insist that all coalitions come out for socialism. But for the most advanced people, for the people who are really starting to, their eyes are kind of starting to see the whole picture, well, that's a conclusion which, which flows from this crisis of capitalism, which as I said earlier, is not just cyclical, but it is structural. It is 
in the inherent essence, if you will, of this system, which is aggressive, which is predatory, which is warlike, um, uh, and which is based on exploitation. That's how the rich get richer, because they exploit us. So the, that alternative is, is socialism. So um, um, that's what, what we're trying to do. And we're confident because more and more people are recognizing that, uh, in fact, this struggle against austerity has got to be not just against something, against Harper or against McGinty. It has to be for something. And in our... Um, a leaflet, which unfortunately is still in the printers, it's going to be out shortly, you'll probably see it. Uh, it puts forward a kind of a, an immediate um, kind of program for a people's recovery. Not a recovery for profit, not a recovery for capital, but a recovery for people, um, which deals with uh, the question of uh, um, extending um, uh, um, social programs like health care and education and pensions and so on, raising the minimum wage, uh, reducing and eliminating tuitions as opposed to just freezing tuitions and so on, uh, um, measures to increase uh, sharply taxation on, on, uh, uh, on corporate wealth and reduce taxes on, on, on uh, working people, and especially young people, a whole bunch of other measures to nationalize our uh, resources in this country and use all of the wealth that's generated from natural resources for the people and not for, not for private gain, private profit. So we have a program for people's recovery. Um, the slogan, People's Recovery, uh, I think is a good one because it, it, it suggests that uh, we want to differentiate between their recovery. We want a recovery for the 99%, not for the 1%. But in a certain sense, it's also a problematic slogan because we don't think there can be really a genuine, uh, uh, sustainable recovery of the system, and we don't want to see a recovery of capitalism. You know, capitalism has showed its true colors, and every day more and more people are getting it. You know, so while we put forward this short-term program, we also talk about the need uh, uh, to uh, uh, indeed uh, to struggle for for socialism. And that's what we're going to be trying to do. And part of that, of course, is to build our party, to build the YCL in the process. So for those of you who are, uh, uh, are, are thinking about it or are prepared to think about it, we invite you to do it. We have a special website, by the way, in addition to the party's main website, which we set up for this campaign. It's called People's Recovery, People's Recovery .ca. Uh And uh, it should be up and running within, uh, I think it's, it might even be up now today, but certainly in the next, uh, uh, next day or so. Uh, so check it out and uh, get involved in our campaign, help to spread our ideas. Thank you. Thank you.